technical difficulties, but I think we're good now. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sitting down with Jess Peters today from Pennsylvania. Jess um, works on and owns and operates one a family dairy in Pennsylvania and um, also has some social media platforms where she shares her own story and agriculture story. So Jess, if you could maybe just kind of start off by giving us a little bit of a background on you and who you are just to get things rolling. Yeah, so uh, my name is Jess Peters, and like you said, I own a dairy farm with my family in Pennsylvania. Um, I own it with my parents and my younger brother. My older brother actually works for NASA. Oh, wow. Which, yeah, yeah, I don't bring it up. Not that I'm not proud of him, but, you know, like, once you mention NASA, people are like, oh, cow. <laughs> all my questions go. Yeah, like, <laughs> I like to at least, you know, get some words in before people ask me about, you know, rocket science. <laughs> Because I can't answer most of the questions. Well, if it makes um, you feel better, I know nothing about space and NASA, so we don't even have to go there today. Oh, cool, cool. Um, well, uh, where was I? Oh, I have. I grew up on this farm, and my brother, my younger brother, and I are fifth generation. But it hasn't been a like general pass father to son kind of passing like most farms. Uh, my dad actually um, became a partner with my grandma's first cousin. Okay. Um, and he never had any kids and never married, so my dad. Kind of became a partner that way. Um, I went to Penn State to get a degree in animal sciences, and when I graduated, I had I knew I wanted to come home to the farm someday, but I also knew I wasn't ready to be stuck here <laughs> in the nicest way possible. Right. Um, so I actually moved and lived in New Zealand for two years. Oh, wow. Very cool. I went for a year, and then I came home for a year, and then I went back for a year because I knew I wasn't ready to be here. Scared the crap out of my dad. I'm pretty sure. Thought I was <laughs> never coming back. Um, but yeah, I did. So here I am. We milk all jerseys. We own about 500 total, milk about 250 of them. We do all of our own crops and all the crops we raise go to feeding our cows. Okay. So, which is what we're doing today. Someone's, you know, tilling some ground. We're emptying a manure pit and hopefully finishing planting corn soon. <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed for you on that. Um, hopefully the weather holds out, which I don't know is Pennsylvania summers. I mean, I'm sure it gets hot, but does it stay mild enough it's, to be able to do all that oh it's like a crap shoot um you know like the days have been pretty warm 70s 80s sunny uh nights get down to like 50 okay you know so it's very sporadic and we're pretty dry right now which is pretty rare for spring okay we typically get wetter springs hmm. when conditions are right we grow some really good crops but let's just say conditions are very rarely right yeah <laughs> depending kind of like everything else going on in the world right you don't know what the heck pretty much <laughs> Yeah, 2020 has not exactly been anybody's year, has it? Yeah, man, that's that's a mouthful right there, that's for sure. Yeah. Going back to um, the cows a little bit, and I want to come back to the New Zealand thing as well, but going back to jerseys, uh, first of all, I know you're a big jersey advocate. Um, why do you love jerseys? Uh, well, a lot of people ask me why we have jerseys, and if I'm being completely honest, like, I did not start this farm. So we have jerseys because we've always had jerseys. Right. You know, I, it's not the answer anybody wants, but it's the <laughs> truth. And jerseys are by far the smallest breed of dairy cows. So once you have jerseys, like when we redid our, we, we built a milk barn 20 some years ago and um, we've redone the stalls a couple of times since, you build everything to their size. Right. So once you start with jerseys, it's not like I can just sell half of them and buy Holsteins. They wouldn't fit. Right. You know, it'd be the smallest of Holsteins that would fit into our parlors. So it's, I've got some big jerseys that squeeze into some stalls, you know? Right. Um, but, you know, they've done a lot more, sur or I was going to say surgery, research in the last five to 10 years about why they're a better cow. Um, and I mean, really all across the front, I mean, some people are just love what they love. You know, some people will never own anything but a golden retriever dog, and that's right. great. Right. But, um, you know, they found that they're actually more economical. They're a more feed efficient cow. So what that means is it takes less feed and less water and less land to raise them to get proportionately the same amount of product. Um, so their carbon footprint is actually a lot less than the bigger breeds okay. by almost 30%. Wow. You know, so they're a more sustainable cow. They produce less waste. They produce less gas, which is a huge thing considering the whole world is blaming farmers for greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, and they're smaller cows. You know, our our hoof was just here today, actually, and I'm not saying we don't have cows that have foot issues, but they can deal, like, sometimes we'll put a cow up to be trimmed, and we didn't even know she had an issue, because they're small enough that they're not going to limp, or it's not going to affect them as much as it did those big, like, you know, 1,500-pound cows. These guys are only 900 pounds. Right. 
right. which is a lot, but you know, comparatively. Right, comparatively. So, and they're yeah, just they're, they're just so much cuter. <laughs> they I are just can't. They are. I'm not a dairy, I don't have a dairy background, um, but they are really cute. I have to give you that. Those eyes, man. Yes. You know, you'll be you'll be feeding a calf. We had twin heifers born the other day and um you know, typical to even like twin humans, like they're a little harder to raise. Usually one's a little weaker than the other. And mm -hmm. so the, the weak one is just starting to stand four days later and she drives me crazy. Like she wants to drink, so I have to feed her, but she drinks in these tiny little sips. Mm -hmm. So it takes like 40 minutes to feed one calf. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and just when you just like want to smack her, she just looks at you and you're just like, oh, you're adorable. <laughs> you know, Dang, I'm not mad be at so you. Cute. Exactly. <laughs> So what that's is, why God made them that way, right? Yeah, so annoying to deal with. Yeah, you they can't have get out of them. You have to love them. Yeah. <laughs> what does um the so what is your product used for? What is your milk um, that you guys milk uh, in your parlor? What does it go to? So our milk specifically goes to a fluid plant. Okay. So it's it's bottled for fluid milk. Okay. Okay. So that's a little bit different than um, some some different people I've talked to because. We've gotten the butter, cheese, um, all kinds of things. So your milk is milk. Um, it is milk. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and going back to, to New Zealand, how, what was that like? And were you working on a dairy there? Or what was it like being international? <clears throat> well, it all started with, um, I went to college at Penn State. I was in the Dairy Science Club. Um, surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, and every year at spring break, they do a trip. Um, and every three or four years, they do a big international trip. So every senior class at least has the opportunity to go internationally. Okay. Uh, so my senior year, we decided we want to go to New Zealand, which is almost as far away as you can possibly get yeah. from here. Um, so because it was a bit more of an expensive trip and because of the different hemispheres, we actually went over Christmas break because one, we could go for two weeks. If you're going to fly 35 hours, like, a week is not long enough to be there. Right, right. Um, so we went for two weeks and it was summer there when we went. So uh, it worked out really well. And we toured around on the North Island, you know, typical like bus tour with a big right. group of people. And it was a beautiful country and I really liked it, but you know, it was kind of like, I'm glad I went, but okay. Um, so then the end of college came closer and two of my friends, two of my best friends actually, had gotten a job over there on one of the farms we'd visited. You know, I was kind of a little jealous. Like the three of us were really close my senior year. And you're like, oh, well, I don't know. You know, just jealous that they were going. And right. as graduation got closer, I was like, I'm really not ready to go home to the farm. You know, I've got some things I want to do. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't have any other options. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to New Zealand too. And I ended up being on a completely different farm on a completely different island. But within a three-week span, I had called, emailed, gotten my passport and it was on an airplane. Wow. Going to New Zealand. Wow. <laughs> freaking out about life. I'm sure. Um, oh my gosh. What a drastic I, I didn't know anybody. Yeah, I didn't know anybody over there. Um it was just it, it was kind of amazing really. Um obviously it worked out. I met a lot of friends there and my two friends who had worked on the other farm ended up coming and living and working with me on the farm I was on. Oh cool. Because at the time the dairy industry in New Zealand was like the land of milk and honey. Like you could not stop making money like you could have the worst farm in the world and you'd still be making a bunch of money right um they they have since kind of unfortunately activists have found them and you know covid and everything but mm -hmm. uh yeah i worked on two dairy farms and they didn't know me that well you know they knew my resume and i'd grown up on a farm but so by the time i got there they had another manager that didn't work out and i ended up managing that herd um and then i came home for a year and kind of the same deal i just wasn't i, I could feel i wasn't ready to be home Right. Uh, so a friend had contacted me and his wife was having their first child at the same time all 800 of their cows were. Oh my gosh. They calved they seasonally. And he was not the animal half of that, you know, couple. Right. So he called and he was like, would you come back? And I'm like, yeah, I would. Um, and then that was the point I think my dad really thought I was like done. I wasn't He's coming gone. home. <laughs> and I kept telling him, you know, yeah. Um, and there was this moment you know, in the movies, they always have like an epiphany moment mm -hmm. and everything starts to fall into place and they know exactly what they're going to do with their life. You right. always think it's just in the movies. Um, well, I was over there. I was fixing, if I was on that farm, I could take you to the paddock I was in. I was fixing a fence. They have miles of electric fence. That's how they keep all their animals in. Okay. And I always got shocked. Like I was like super twitchy because I just got shocked constantly. 
Uh, and I, I wasn't even getting shocked. Everything was going fine. I was working on the fence and I looked up and I looked around and I thought, man, this is the most beautiful place I have ever been. It is. And then I took a deep breath and, and I thought, I'm ready to go home. And that was it. You know, I was set to go home a few months later. So I stayed and finished it out. But all the things that annoyed me about working there or the people that I had to work with all went away because yeah. I knew like I was done. I was going to go home. Yeah. What a cool experience. And then um, kind of a validity amazing. of, wow, I'm, I've done what I need to do and I'm ready to go do what I'm meant to do for the rest of my life. That's awesome. Um, and I will say when you live in a different country by yourself, I mean, I had plenty of friends, but you know what I mean? Um, it teaches you a lot about you. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I bet there was a, not only a revelation of like, okay, I've done what I need to do, but like I've become the person I'm ready to be as well. Yeah, I, I grew up, I changed quite a bit between um, college and when I came home full time. Those two years were a big deal. Were the, like, I guess to going back to a little bit about more of their practices in New Zealand, were things like processes different or is it pretty much kind of across the board um, the same kind of things? I mean, a cow is a cow, right? <laughs> wherever you go. So that part of it was very familiar, which is good because the way they do it is completely different. Okay. You know, they don't have um, buildings really. They had like, you know, a two or three sided uh, building that was their milking parlor okay. that cows came in and out of. Their calf barns um, were basically open commodity sheds with gates on the front. Hmm. They maybe had one tractor per farm and you mostly got around on four wheelers or dirt bikes. Um, you know, it was just a whole different experience. And a lot of people, you know, I came home and dad was like, what did you apply there that you can apply here? And I'm not saying there wasn't anything you could apply, but it's, it's a whole different system. Yeah. You know, in the way they think and right. you, you couldn't do what they do. You could probably do it somewhere here, but I know in Pennsylvania, it definitely would not be an option. You needed a lot more stuff yeah. than they had. Yeah crazy that's such a cool experience I am I've traveled to New Zealand on kind of a similar trip I guess that you did um, right before I went to college actually and just what a what an amazing place and great people it's sure. gorgeous it's oh it's stunning I always get a little too excited when I find out people want are like are going there on vacation yeah I'm like can I just tell you where to go like yes. will you just let me let me plan out your trip <laughs> let me plan your trip tour guide Jess right <laughs> yeah right I'm I'm all in <laughs> So switching gears just a little bit, um, you also are an author of a children's book. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. What made you kind of want to... Um, I should have grabbed one. Yeah, we need some... I don't know where I have one right promotion. now. I, should, I know, right? <laughs> I'll link it too. Um, I'll link it in the description once this all gets posted and stuff. But oh, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. First of all, is it bad that I always forget that I wrote a book and I never like mention it? <laughs> no, like I mean, other people mention it to me. And you're like, oh, it's yeah. It's so weird. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I wrote a book. <laughs> um, well, it started out, I have a nephew who, he's actually going to be here tomorrow. Lives oh. in Florida. Wow. My older brother and his wife have a, a, he's six now. When he was two, you know, even that young, he loved being out on the farm, seeing the tractors and giving rides on the four-wheeler. And so he had a book about construction equipment. And his, his skid loaders have always been his favorite thing. Skid loader toys, riding a skid loader, hearing the skid loader, pictures of skid loaders just obsessed. Um, and there was a song in the book about a skid loader. And it was basically, I think, Itsy Bitsy Spider rewritten uh -huh. to talk about a skid loader. And I thought, that's a really like clever thing to do. And it would be so easy to do. Right. So that night when I milked, I wrote one. It was called Big Loud Shiny Chopper. It's in my book. Um, it, and it just, I don't know how to explain it, but I have this thing with words and ever since I was little I've always been very particular about the words I choose maybe not so much when I talk because it's kind of just like word vomit but you know when I write things out I'm very particular about how it sounds and the words I use and um it did not take me I wrote 11 songs and it probably took me a week wow uh they just like I, okay. I love rhyming it just like rolled out of my head so I made him a little like one of those picture books you can make online mm -hmm. with there was a song on each page and then it was just filled with pictures of the farm you know, on the, there's a song called Big Blue Tractor. So on that page, there was pictures of the tractor working in the field or just the tractor or the tractor okay. and the manure spreader. And um, I just made him a picture book and I had a coupon. So I made 10 of them. <laughs> I sent them to friends and cousins and family who had little kids. And 
everyone was like, oh, you should totally get this published. And I was like, nah, I just did it for my nephew. Yeah. Um, and about a year later, his other aunt, his, um, my sister-in-law's sister said, if you have an extra book, you should send it to his preschool. Because he goes in and tries to talk about the farm and nobody knows what he's talking about. And right. I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So I sent one down. And it wasn't until my brother told me he had gone to pick Cannon up, my nephew. And um, he said one of the parents, well, first of all, the teacher had been asking him farming questions. And he didn't understand where they were coming from. And it turns out they were coming from my book. Oh. She'd been singing it to the class. And then a couple parents were asking where they could buy it because they knew their kid was singing the tune to Mary Had a Little Lamb but they were singing grandpa has a dairy farm <laughs> and they like, they couldn't understand the words they were saying. Right. <laughs> and that was the first moment that I realized that this silly little book of farm songs could teach not just the kids singing it, but the parents singing it to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Give them a real look of what we do. Right. Yeah. So um, one of the things I love is that in the published book, there are illustrations, but there are also real pictures of us and my nephew and my family working on our farm. Very cool. Yeah, what a cool uh, tool, I guess, really, as an educational yeah. tool to entertain your nephew and uh, spread some... Oh, he's not entertained by it anymore. Like, <laughs> he's when it got published, yeah, when it got published, like, a year and a half later, I was like, hey, can you sing one of the songs for me? And he was like, no, I don't do that <laughs> <I'm> anymore. <over> <laughs> it. I don't even think I have that book. And I was like, <laughs> That's hilarious. That's, that's so cool. So where can uh, your book be found? Uh, it's for sale on Amazon, which is okay. nuts. That's crazy. Um, it's called farm nursery songs farm nursery um yeah that's, that's i think you can get it on barnes and nobles online too okay. but you know amazon like everyone goes to amazon so right yeah easy um put it get your prime you can have it in two days right like that right <laughs> if you order early enough in the day you might get it by tomorrow exactly i know i'll have to go i'll have to go order it i saw it and i was like how crazy is that um but my thing i gotta say this little plug I got to write the about the author too, mm -hmm. and it rhymes. The whole thing rhymes. I love it. <laughs> so um, I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> yes, and if you um, don't follow Jess on social media, which you should if you don't, um, because she is hilarious. Like I seriously go on her <laughs> stories and laugh the entire time I'm watching them. And um, she has an excellent voice. Like she has one of the, you know people sing, and you're like, okay, yeah, whatever. But Jess like genuinely has a beautiful voice. Um, so it's very entertaining to laugh. Especially when I'm singing yeah. Disney songs. Absolutely. Yes. I just, I just can't not sing a good Disney song. Yes. It makes um, the day a little bit better. But Jess is also um, an advocate for mental health awareness too. And that's something that I think, um, you know, doesn't get talked enough about maybe in agriculture, especially. And, uh, we're all a little bit crazy, I guess, if we're trying to make money being in the agriculture industry, you know, <laughs> working all day and then going to pull crap at 2 a.m. But we're all already a little mental. Yes, like, we're a little, we're there's, there's a screw loose already. Um, but in all seriousness, um, I think it, it is a, a really powerful thing to talk about. So, what kind of made you take that avenue in um, your platform? I 100% never thought I'd be that person. Um, you know, I think, I think pretty much everyone at this point, you've had those issues in your life. Um, and not just still as a society, like farmers, I think are worse about mm -hmm. not wanting to talk about it, but even in society, it's just, it's such a taboo thing. Right. And it started with a video I did, um, two or three years ago now I write for Hordes Dairyman a bit online too, which is a dairy right. magazine. And, um, they, they know me, but they tell, like, they let me write whatever I want to write. And, I'd been thinking about it for a month. And like I said, I'm pretty good with words and what I choose to say. And I'd been thinking about this for a while. It was called Dear Struggling Farmer. And I was just thinking about how, God, it's like one thing goes wrong and then two things go wrong and three things go wrong. And all of a sudden you're in this hole and you don't laugh or smile anymore. And it feels like nobody notices and, mm -hmm. you know, and it just snowballs. And you feel like you don't have anyone to talk to because who's going to want to listen? Um, and I finally found the courage. I was sitting on my four-wheeler in the middle of my milk barn and I just filmed it. It took me like seven tries <laughs> um, because one, I'd either forget what I wanted to say or two, I'd just start like sobbing in the middle of it, Yeah. to be completely honest. Um, and I finally got it done. I sent it to Hordes. I was like, look, I want to put this video out there because as scary as it is for me to say this, um, I think a lot of people are feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. And I think I you know, said it in a way that people can relate to. And I will put it out any way I can, but they had a bigger audience. Right. You know, that was 100% my goal, as many people to see this as possible. 
And I sent it to her and she immediately emailed me back and was like, we're going to do this. I don't know how yet. And that, you know, they don't do video blogs. They right. do it's written blogs. And they're like, yeah. somehow we're going to do this. So they finally got back to me a few days later and was like, all right, this is the date because they wanted to add captions and, you know, figure it out, make sure they put out their rights. Every day between then and when she published it, I was like, I typed out an email being like, yeah, you know, maybe we don't put it out. Maybe we, uh. Pump the brakes on this one. <laughs> just sit on that for a while. Because it's just, it's, well, it's one thing to film it in your barn. And it's another to suddenly realize people are going to watch it mm -hmm. and see you get all choked up about it and talk about how hard it is. Um, so I, I, I bit my tongue a lot until it finally came out. And the response was completely overwhelming. You know, and in the video, I said, you know, find me if you need to talk. I'm not a specialist. I'm not a therapist, but I know what you're going through because I'm going through it too. Right. Um, tens of thousands of people had to have found me. For three months straight, I got at least a dozen messages a day. You know, not just from farmers, but from, you know, men or women who's like, well, my, my girlfriend or boyfriend is a farmer and I had no idea what they were feeling. I used to complain that they wouldn't want to go out with me at night. And then I watched your video and mm -hmm. I realized that's exactly how they feel. You know, and I got messages from consumers who had nothing to do with farming who were like, I know I followed you for a while and you mentioned how things are bad, but I didn't, I didn't think it was this bad. Um, and that kind of opened the door for me. Um, and then I wrote a few more articles really talking about my experience with it. And as hard as it is to be that vulnerable and open on social media, one, it's easier because I film it and then I can pretend no one's going to see it. Right. And that's a little easier. Yeah. Um, but two, and this is a pretty recent realization, um, not one, sharing my story is helping others. And that's helping me. Mm -hmm. um, but to be a little selfish about it, you know, the more you talk about it, the more you get others to talk about it. But what I didn't realize until recently is me talking about my experience is helping me get over it more. Absolutely. You know, it, it's been years since I felt that bad in that way. Right. Um, but you hold on to these thoughts and feelings that you don't realize you're holding on to. And, you know, selfishly, the more I share that out loud and the more I see that other people have felt or are feeling those things, yes, it helps them to know they're not alone, but it's really helped me you know, get over even more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really I probably a little sense of validation that, Hey, I'm not losing my mind. You know, this is a right? thing that everybody goes through, um, yeah. whether in a, in a big scope or even just a small scope, everybody, you know, has feelings like that at some point in time. Um, and if you don't, you're not human. So, <laughs> well, I think you're, if you don't, you're lying to yourself. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And what, what's really amazed me is the further down this road I've gone, you know, it started out mostly just women confessing to me mm -hmm. because we're just generally more open with our feelings right um now I get probably at least a dozen messages a day about mental health and how people are feeling and it's young people old people men women it's all across the board that's awesome you yeah. know and it's still every time I get a message it takes me back like I can't believe this person is trusting me with right this information but it just shows me how much we need this in agriculture For how much sure. we need to be talking about this mm-hmm yeah, it's a topic. I, I mean, like I said, I don't think it's um, talked about enough and um, I commend you for, for doing it and being open and telling your story. And um, I appreciate you for doing that. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you for that. I, I hate to be that person that needs the validation, but this is not easy stuff to talk about. No, absolutely not. And um, first of all, agriculture is not easy to talk about when everybody is seems like is fighting back and telling you that you're wrong and what you're doing is not right. And then to add mental health onto that, it's just, I'm sure it's extremely overwhelming. So, um, like I said, I commend you and I appreciate you for doing what you're doing because it's, it's big and it's powerful. Well, I appreciate you saying that. For sure. Cause that, I will say that validation, it keeps you going, you know, you put something out there and you think oh, nobody's going to watch this or care or, mm -hmm. you know, and then the, the comments help. They help me Every you know, mental health Monday, every Monday I try and post something and you know, the comments from last Monday are going to give me the courage to say whatever I want to say next Monday. Right. Right. And even sometimes, um, even I know just personally, just little things, if it's just one person that I feel like I've impacted or t educated one person, then that's just kind of the fuel to keep it, keep it all going. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. So changing things a little bit back to a little bit high, light heartedness. Um, and this is my personal, I think the most important question of this interview to wrap it up. But oh once June is over and once the flip cup challenge is over, 
what is your next MC and host um, position that you're taking over? Oh, I don't know. I feel like the world is just open, <laughs> full of opportunity for me. Right? I I'm seriously would. I seriously would love to just be that person who like goes from agricultural event to event. Just like give me like a walking microphone. Uh huh. And let me let me just like co-mingle with people. Yeah, you just need a table on the sidelines with some headphones, right? And you're the next Pretty broadcaster. Much. <laughs> Pretty much. I will say I do actually have, I'm not going to tell you what it is, um, just in case I can't pull it off. <laughs> but I do have kind of a big uh, social media thing I want to do in August. Okay. And um, my, my brain doesn't work the way most advocates' brains work. I am, I, you know, I'm not, I know some people do and that's great. They make money off their social media. I am not one of them, mm -hmm. which is probably dumb. I should be trying to make more money as, as much time as I put into it. Right. I should probably be, um, you know, trying to at least make any money off of it. But um, what drives me is how fun it's going to be for people to see. Like, even if it's this milk clip cup thing has been amazing to watch. I have absolutely loved it. Yes. Um, knowing now, I didn't know in the beginning how much work was going to go into this. I don't think Gosh. any of us did. <laughs> Um, knowing that now I'm not sure I'd have done it then. yes but now it's totally worth it you know what I mean like I have found myself I will exhaust myself if I think it's going to be fun for someone else to watch mm -hmm. yes and, and that's, um go ahead that's one thing that you definitely keep everything fun and lighthearted. I when I first saw I can't even remember whose page I saw that you guys were doing this challenge on and then the next thing I saw was you and you're like, okay, I'm the new self-appointed MC. And I was like, oh, this has just got like 10 times better. <laughs> well, they were like, oh, well, we had our list of people we wanted to ask. And, you know, the list is, we wanted 16 people and it's like 25 people long. And I was like, look, I don't have to do it. I can just like commentate. And that's mm -hmm. when I was like, oh no, I'm going to be the MC for this. <laughs> so, you know, any of your dairy, well, you know what, even just agricultural based Instagram competitions, if you need a professional or well, semi-professional MC, I feel like you know who to call. Absolutely. Yep. The top niche the, market. Top of the list now. For top, sure. top <laughs> list. I need full creative, like, um, you know, what's the word? Power full creative license. Them. License. Yeah, right. license. Yeah, because um, I've got some funny things I want to do before this flip cup thing's open or over. But again, if I, I have the ideas and technologically, I'm not quite as advanced as I should be probably. I'm getting better. <laughs> but um, yeah. Well, thank you um, for being you and sharing your story on agri on uh, social media and um, continuing to make everybody laugh and feel better about their day. And um, yeah, thank you for joining me and taking some time out of your busy schedule to sit down and chat about some stuff with me. Thanks for asking me. I got to sit down and yeah. chat with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that um, felt good because it sounds such like a win. My seat's like sitting still. It's not like vibrating, you know? <laughs> sitting on a tractor for that long. Yeah, then you get off and you feel like you can't walk right or it's like the world's moving, right? <laughs> yeah, or my like my tailbone hurts because it, you know, you're bouncing slightly the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's necessary, but not exactly fun. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jess. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day and hope that whoever watches this um, gets something out of it. Yeah, me too. Thank you.